very little money, yet they're pressured and in slavery and bondage to what is, in all intents and purposes, a commercial time of year and not a religious time of year, not a spiritual time of year. And many are really struggling today. And I'm going to give you some statistics, but I, I wanted to bring a scripture which comes from the book of Nehemiah. So if you can get out the book of Nehemiah. Well, I talk a little bit about Nehemiah himself. Nehemiah uh, was a eunuch in Babylon. He was, uh, uh, he was a cupbearer to the king. He was a servant of, of King uh, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, around 445 BC. And uh, he, he was sent by Artaxerxes to Jerusalem to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. What a massive, massive task God gave him to do. A huge thing. Can you imagine trying to build the city, the, 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 the temple today, even with all our machinery and everything that we have? It, it, it's a massive, massive task. You would have to have a huge workforce, wouldn't you? Uh, the, the, we're told that the um, Temple Institute can rebuild the temple within 12 months. And, and, and I read on the internet that, uh, uh, that uh, the rabbis in, some rabbis in Israel have asked Putin and Trump to help build the temple. Uh, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but, but God's going to build a temple at the end of time, Amen. isn't he? But, but he used, in 500 BC or before that, a man who served in Babylon, who served the king of Persia in Babylon, a man who was a eunuch, was a servant, to build a temple. And he went, and I, I, I spoke a lot about this when I first started to speak about Israel, about the gates of Jerusalem, and all those gates, the Dun Gate, the Fish Gate, and all the meanings of those, and, and how Nehemiah walked around the walls, the broken walls at night, on his, and actually rode his horse at night around all the broken gates, and wept for the city of Jerusalem. But in uh, Nehemiah 5, uh, 4 and 5 actually, we see that he's rebuilding with the people who've gone back from the exile from Babylon. And we're looking at Babylon in the uh, Bible study. We're looking at the Babylon that is going to be rebuilt for the end of time in the Bible study and how that is part of the end time scenario. But we're looking at now at, at, at those exiles who've come out of Babylon, having been there for 70 years with people like Daniel. But when Nebuchadnezzar gets to Jerusalem, he's under pressure from uh, uh, Sanballat, uh, the Ho Horonite, who was a worshipper of the, of the sun god, the god of sin, which is that little first moon god that we see the, the emblem of in some places in the UK, in some religions, you see that God. And Sanballat was against the rebuilding of the temple and the regain, against the rebuilding of Jerusalem, against the restoration of the walls. He was against Nehemiah's call, and he did a lot of things to try and stop Nehemiah. But when we look at these two scriptures, we see there that there's an issue with death, with the people who have gone back, because Nehemiah, he's got us at focus uh, is the building of the city and the build, rebuilding of the walls and, and, and that's what's on his mind. But we'll read shortly that actually there was a, a whole group of people who were working with him to rebuild the temple who were really hungry and who were being charged high rates of interest and for mortgages that they had and they actually wanted uh, Nehemiah to do something about that and stop the payment of interest which was crippling them. Um, because while they'd been in Babylon, they picked up the Babylonian ways, and they'd even renamed the months. Do you know, the, the, if you read Leviticus, the, name, the months are one, two, three, and four, aren't they? Up to nine, and with the tabernacles. And so, but they'd renamed them, and they'd given names such as Tammuz, which is the god Tammuz, and, and other things. So they picked up a lot of things. And, and you and I know that if we're brought up in a tradition, it's really difficult to get out of it, isn't it? It's, it's particularly difficult to get out of that because you think you're in the right tradition. You think you're doing right because your forefathers did it, your fathers did it, your community did exactly the same. And therefore, when it comes to death 
and mortgages and payments of interest and things. They brought with them the Babylonian idea of, monetary, of the monetary system. So they bring with them that. And debt in Babylon, I've got a little book on the banking system of Babylon. Isn't that <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> Jill obviously wants to read it. Another book I'll send you away, Jill. Um, and it, it, it just tells you about the system, which is exactly the same system as we've got today. Similar system. Debt was secured on, on the debtor's own person in Babylon, as it was on property. If a debtor was seized, a, 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 seized for a debt, he could nominate, though, in Babylon, he could nominate someone called a, a mancipium, who was a hostage, or even your wife or children, to be held hostage as servants to pay your debt. So if I had a huge debt, I could send Shirley to my creditor <laughs> to work and clean for them and look after the house. And, and, and the debtor could kill the creditor could keep Shirley for three years. Uh, no longer, because the debt then would be void if they kept her longer, and probably they wouldn't want to keep her longer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, get him back in. So because she would, she would put him in his place every day. Would, hey, every morning it would be Michael. So you had this hostage. The debtor could also pledge his property, which is what we do today, isn't it? You buy a property, you get a mortgage, and and uh, and, and and often you could pledge a field or a house or or any property, a shop or whatever you had of intrinsic value. And, uh, which uh, the article of which was equal to the debt, and then you'd pay interest. So it's exactly the same as we see. With, uh, and also there were guarantors for debts. Exactly the same system. If you look at the system of the Torah, there was no interest. There was jubilee, a freeing of debt after seven years, after fifty years. There, there wasn't guarantors. There was an oath. You gave an oath, and and, and you promised on oath to pay back the money. And because you were godly, you kept that oath. And, and, and Yeshua says, let your yes be yes, and you no be no. And you stuck to what you promised. But in Babylon, they tied you up in debt. So the people were, were in that same monetary system when they went back to Jerusalem. So I'm going to read from Nehemiah 4, 16 to 23. And we'll pick up, as we go along, some of the things that, are, that may be important to us today. Some of the lessons that we... Can learn from today and then after we're going to pray prayer so nehemiah 4 16 to 23 i've used the niv today says from that day half of the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears shields and bows and arms this is this is the story of the rebuilding of jerusalem so i picked the story up halfway through the officers posted themselves behind the people of Judah because we see that Judah was in Babylon for seven years and they came back to rebuild with Nehemiah. And we, we've been studying in the Bible uh, group that uh, Daniel was from the tribe of Judah. He was out there for 70 years. And part of that reason was because they hadn't kept Shabbat in the land and God wanted the land to rest for 70 years. And that's why they were in Babylon for that long. So they're back now with Judah rebuilding. And it says, um, the officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon with the other hand. It's... It's, for me, that speaks volumes of what we're trying to do in our spiritual lives today. We're actually working. We serve the community. We serve our congregation. We build, don't we? We work every day to build. And, and, and in, in our other hand, we use our prayers, our spiritual warfare, the weapons of the spiritual realm, not to fight in the physical, but to fight in the darkness. And if we are intent and focused on building in the natural, which we, have, which we do, we? we build homes, we build lives, we build for our next generation, and we build all those things, then we also have to use the spiritual gifts that God has given us to make sure that we're in line with building with what God wants to build. Because God doesn't want us to build something that is going to be worthless in the spiritual realm, does he? He doesn't want us to build a mosque here, does he? He wants us to build a church. 
He doesn't want us to build a, a brothel. He wants to build a place that will give him glory and not sit. Do you know what I mean? He can't build, or he doesn't want us to build a commercial thing. I, I, you know, me and Shirley and my family particularly are business people. We could build business. But actually God doesn't want us to do that. He wants to build with us, with you, to build a place of worship and a place of teaching. So, so the work that Nehemiah was doing saw people working in the natural but were ready to fight. Here it says in the, in the natural as well because they were fighting or opposed to Sanballat, what Sanballat was trying to do, destroy him. But actually for us, I can equal that to being working in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. And it's really important as well that as we move forward with prayer and fasting as we're moving forward, that we all build together, that not just a few uh, build. I, I was here yesterday, there was a, I wasn't involved in the prayer and fasting, although I was fasting, I didn't get involved in the prayer, but there was only a small group, wasn't there, of you. We, there needs to be more, you know. We, I'd spoken to um, uh, uh, Gary Sidwell, on Thursday night, and he was telling me that he's also got this this desire for more prayer. And currently, from the the uh, cafe in Chester, the Christian cafe. Has anybody any? I keep saying to people, have they been there? Dave's been. Great. Just keep going there. When you go to Chester, don't go into Nero or to Costa. Go into this cafe. It's beautiful. What's Absolutely called? beautiful. It's oh, the, Oasis the, the Oasis Cafe, right in the old market. It's beautiful. Oasis of America. Yes, that's right. So he also is, and, and is, try, is feeling that God wants to increase prayer. So we need to increase it. I didn't come on Friday because I was meeting, I went to meet with David Hansen, our MP. And it was a blessing because he had no one else in the surgery. There was no one else waiting. And the assembly member was there as well, Hannah Blythin. And it was just, I, and thank you for your prayers for that because I just know that was God's provision. So I had a lot of time with him. I don't know whether he was pleased with that, but I was. <laughs> and, uh, but Hannah Blythe, our assembly member, was actually, she knew a little bit about Israel, and she wasn't opposed to Israel at all. So I just kind of thought, you know, God is so good, isn't he? But, but there was prayer going on here, and there'll be prayer going on throughout next year, more and more. And I, well, we've got to get a date for the prayer, Judith, for uh, Bangor on D for Passover on the 10th of April. But... We just feel that there's a need for more prayer. So let's pick up on verse 18. And it says, Each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with Nehemiah. You know, the sound of the trumpet is really important that we announce the presence of God, that we actually share what God's doing. I, was, I haven't stopped thinking and thanking God for the testimony that Marie Crawford gave, gave here last week Amen. when clearly she was totally healed. Amen. When she said that she'd had these growths so they were confirmed and going to, the, to have an operation and the surgeon said, they're not there. Thank you. I mean, we pray Praise that, don't we, that when people Praise go for surgery, Amen. Father, just would you make sure that when they get to the operation operating table that the, that the things have gone? Well, this was testimony that they had. Amen. So we've got to tell people about that, you know. We've got to an announce what God's doing. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us, Nehemiah says, here. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half of the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars come out. I love that. Because we get up and the first thing we should do is pray, isn't it? And the last thing we should do at night is pray. We should work. You know, there's no time to be tired or lie in bed in the kingdom. I've got to say that. There isn't. Because there's so much to do, isn't there? I mean, those of you who are working as well, I, I applaud you. You know, I, I just think if you've got a big job and, and you're still working in the kingdom, you know, that is amazing. People say, well, they're Martha's. No, they're not. They are passionate believers in Yeshua who want to serve Almighty God. That's, that's just wonderful. So we continued to work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn to, till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workers by day. 
So he, he was really working them, wasn't he? I had, a, I had a sergeant who used to say to me, are you, are you doing anything tonight? And I said, well, yeah, I'm going to bed. I'm going to get back from ship, 10, 10 o'clock. He said, well, if you're doing nothing else, just come in and do a couple of hours between three and four on some observations. And, and, and as young lads, we do it. <laughs> we go in. But that's how... You know, well, that's how you do things, isn't it, very often? If God wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, then he's woken you up for a reason. Gary Sidwell said to me on Thursday night, he said, you know, sometimes I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I know God's asking me to pray and I go back to sleep and I know that, you know, he, wants, he wanted me to pray for something. And, and I said, well, I, I'm exactly the same. So that night, 3 o'clock, God woke me. I really sure he did. So... Yeah, God enjoys it. Yeah, he does. And then it goes on in verse 23. Neither I and my brothers, nor my men, nor my guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. So they were equipped and ready. They were prepared to help wherever, whenever, whatever time. They were prepared. They were switched on. And they were not only going to rebuild Jerusalem, but they were going to stop anything stopping them rebuilding Jerusalem. They were totally focused on the rebuilding of Jerusalem because they knew it was God. And that's where we need to be. If we know it's God, we need to be totally focused on what he's called us to do. Okay. Moving into chapter 5, it shouldn't actually, actually have those chapters. They yeah. should do away with them. But anyway, it goes on. It says, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during this famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we were of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and although our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. That word keeps coming up with me with God saying slavery. This, this week has been all that. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Now there are a lot of scriptures that said that God is going to give the people of Israel back their vineyards, their fields, their houses. And it says even the Gentiles would go and rebuild for them. So, you know, God is restoring things for them as well today as he was 500 years before Yeshua. Then Nehemiah says, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was angry. I pondered them in my mind and I accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could not find anything to say against Jeremiah and Nehemiah. So I continued, Nehemiah says, what are you doing? What you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of God to avoid the reproach of, of our Gentile enemies? He's, he's actually get, getting, if you look deeper into this, he's actually talking about the Torah now because he's saying, you know, our, my people are, our people are poor. And what does the Torah say? The Torah is, is give to the poor. Don't charge interest, release debt. Help the poor in their time of need. Don't allow the poor to, 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 um, to be neglected within your community, within your, your family. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah is blaming the Gentiles for increasing the uh, impoverished state of the poor. And then he says in verse 10, I, I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging this interest. So what's happening here is Nehemiah is realizing, because he's been in Babylon for all these years, he's grown up in this monetary system, and he's quite high up in society, but he's realizing that things are wrong. And instead of saying, well, it's tradition, and I'm quite happy with the way things are going on, and I, you know, it's all right for me, I'm doing well, he says, let's stop. And I'm going to talk a little bit about traditions of men, but, but you know, when it comes to traditions of men, let's stop. 
It's hard to stop doing the things that, that aren't right in our society. It would be hard for Parliament to stop doing certain things. You know, the, the claiming of massive expenses or, or, or living the lavish lifestyle, some of them, or, or um, occupying very nice places to have meetings like Parliament, a massive building that's going to cost billions to restore. You know, what, what's wrong with saying stop? How many of you have said stop to something in your lives? You have. I have. I know you. I know you've, you've actually said stop. I'm not doing anything. Any, I'm not doing this anymore. Because you know two things. It, one, it dishonors God. And secondly, it brings your soul into demise or your lifestyle into demise. And so we've said stop, haven't we? we we've done it. It's hard. But it's been done. And Nehemiah says stop. He says, let us stop charging interest. Now interest is income. So you're giving up something which is income. Many of us have given up our jobs because the, our income because we want to serve the Lord. Many people have done that. Many people have given away all their income to serve the Lord. It's, many people have... Money is actually worthless in the kingdom of God. Yeshua says, doesn't he, to the rich man, you know, just give away your money. What's important is God. The end of the day. They're the riches, the riches of heaven of God himself. And then Nehemiah says, give back the fields, the vineyards, their olive groves and their houses. So not only just stop charging interest, give them what they their own property, and also the interest you are charging them, which is actually the fulfillment of the Torah, the releasing of debt. 1% of the money of grain, new wine, and oil. We will give it back, he said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as they say. Then he says that he summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath for what they promised. So again, oaths, oaths are really important. If you promise something, fulfill it. If, we, you know, if we're going to promise God we're going to pray more, you know that's a promise to God. It is. It's, and I'm not twisting your arm or anything. I'm just saying, we do that, don't we? Lord, I'm going to promise you this year I will do this. And then we don't. But you know, it, we're making oaths to Almighty God, aren't we? And, and that's why Nehemiah got the priests the religious, the, the, the spiritual leaders of the community to say, make a promise. You make the promise. As our representatives before heaven, you make the promise that you're going to do this. And the people will follow. And they will stick to the oath. And that's a really important lesson for us all to learn. Whilst in Babylon, they'd taken on the Babylon system of finances, though, hadn't they? And they, they'd forgotten it, but then restored the Torah. They, they'd done the things of man, they followed pagan ways, they realised what they'd done, and then they say, oh, hang on, I'm going to stop this, because it's not right. It brings impoverishment to our fellows, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to change. I'm going to do things differently. When we grow up with particular traditions, we become subject to the conditions, those conditions, and because they're conditions that man has laid upon them, they cause us to go into slavery, don't they? And, 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 and Christmas is one of those things. It, it, it's massively commercial. It's something that drags us into a place of slavery with man. We are enslaved. I know we're enslaved to it spiritually in society. Because we are. you can tell it's a spiritual enslavement. But we're enslaved to commercialism, aren't we? I got some figures from the, uh, from the internet about this. And it says that a third of Britain, this is the report for this year, um, a third of Britons are borrowing money to pay for presents this Christmas, while one in five are taking on credit to pay for food, according to a new research, and this is by the Money Advice Trust report. 
34% have already borrowed money to cover Christmas presents this year. So 34% of people have already borrowed money to pay for Christmas presents. I'm not judging any of these people, please. I, I don't want, I'm not judging them because I've been there. And I tell you, I've had debt. And I've been in that place. I, I, I want to just build this up to get to pray for them after. To help, to see if, if we can help. You know, let's be ready to help. I'm not judging at all. And I, my heart goes out because the pressure of the world is on particularly young families. 34% have borrowed money to pay the cost of Christmas. A figure equating to 16.9 million people have already borrowed money to pay. Of these, more than three quarters are borrowing on credit cards. That's 12.8 million people are borrowing on credit cards to pay for Christmas. With others borrowing from bank overdrafts, 2.9 million people are borrowing from bank overdrafts to pay for Christmas this year. It, it, it's massive, you know. Um, Foods. More than 21% have already borrowed or plan to borrow to put food on the Christmas table. So they're already looking at how we can get money to pay for food on the Christmas table because it, the Christmas dinner has gone up by 14% this year because of uh, increasing money, in, in, uh, yeah, uh, increasing food problems. And that's 10.4 million people who will be borrowing money to pay for their Christmas dinner. Now, that, that's a massive amount of people, isn't it? Of these, more than 78% are borrowing on credit cards. 8.1 million people have bank overdrafts to pay for their meal. It's estimated that 2.3 million have already missed or expect to miss payment on everyday household bills in order to pay for Christmas spending. So... Bless them, they're thinking, I can't, I've got to buy a bike for the little one. I, I can't pay this bill this month. I can't do that. What a decision it is to make. You put yourself in a position of a parent who's got a little child and they've got no money. This is why we can't judge the pressure of that, of that child in school telling them, just make something, a bike for Christmas. And the mum and dad saying, we've got no money. We've got to pay this bill. I've got to pay the electric bill. What are you going to do when your child is pleading with you? You're going to pay for the bike. You're not going to pay the electric bill, are you? Because you think they can wait. But what a terrible position to be in. I remember my dad. We had a big family. We were poor. I keep telling you. We didn't have electric or water. Did I tell you this? I, you know, I loved my Christmas. I did. I did. Cause we were all, it was nice. It was lovely very traditional and really good and we were poor we didn't have anything but, but but we we did my dad grew stuff and he you know we got to we lived in a farming community it was great but i remember i don't know what age it was but i was thinking the other day i remember him making my brother and me my younger brother a little farmyard out of wood out of timber and it was beautiful and he painted it and i've looked back on that must have been really nice for him to do that and it was I thought the other day, the reality of it is that no matter how beautiful that was, that would have been hard for him. Because he worked in the steelworks. He must have come home from work, he had to cut logs, we had a well down the field, get a small hole in, he had to go and get two of these milk churns full of water to pull up for the next day's water, and he had to cut logs, light the fire, get the coal in, you know, and, 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 and then he had to make presents for the kids. That would have been hard, you know. But what I understand is that I don't think people went into debt so much in those times. I think they did and made do, and we thought, you know, it was lovely having this this farmyard. It was brilliant. We never expected bikes. I mean, I went to school on a, on a bike that, it was a, a pass-you-down bike. And it was only when I was in the third year we had wheels on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like... You know, you didn't expect a lot, did you? you know, if you passed your if you passed your exams, you put brakes on your bike. You know? It was like you didn't expect to have great things. But you look at the pressure today. I was reading this week that that now what psychologists are putting this out, and I think these psychologists have been paid by the commercial people. I really do businesses. 
Uh, that, that, they're saying now that children get anxious and stressed on Christmas Eve. And to relieve that stress, shops on the internet now are selling boxes, prepared, made boxes, with the name of the child on, so that you can buy the box. And they're really special boxes to put presents in on Christmas Eve to give presents to the children Christmas Eve, so they're not so stressed and built up for Christmas Day. Now, I tried to buy one of these boxes. I looked at these boxes. The cheapest one was 20 quid. The dearest one was 40 quid. Now, my brothers and sisters may shout at me for saying, because they're business people, for saying we shouldn't be doing that because that's the way business people make money. But I am saying it's wrong. And we should stop it. Because this tradition of boxes only started last year. It's massive this, no, but next year, you make a note of it, next year it will be massive because the child who's at the box will go to school in January and say, I had this box, and the little one who didn't have the box will say, I never had a box. And he'll go to his dad and say, why didn't I have a box? And his dad will say to his mum, listen, get him a box next year. So next year there'll be boxes that you pay 40 quid for. Well, actually, it'll be 42 quid next year because everything's going up 14%. So it's massive, isn't it? So I, I, I don't know, I read a lot of stuff outside Christian circles. And, and I know, so I, I occasionally read this thing called Psychology Today. I'm sad, am I? <laughs> but it had a report there this week on... Um, on Christmas, it said, we're told that Christmas for Christians should be the happiest time and time of the year. An opportunity to be joyful and grateful with family, friends, and colleagues. Yet according to the National Institute of Health, Christmas is the time of year that people experience a high incidence of depression. Hospitals and police reports say there's a high incidence of suicide and attempt suicide. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health professionals report a significant increase in patients complaining about depression. And they quote a North American survey that reported that 45% of respondents to the survey dreaded the festive season. Now, how many times do you go into a shop and people say, do you, uh, are, you, are you getting ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas? And you say, no, I don't do Christmas. And how many say to you, I wish I didn't? Yeah. <clears throat> and, and people are depressed, in, especially the girls behind the counters, the ladies behind the counters, in the, in the checkouts. They, they're wearing these funny hats, aren't they? And they, they don't want to wear funny hats, don't they? Do they? And they, they, yeah, they have from November, yeah. They've been listening to Christmas carols since October. It's like, they don't want to, you know, you say, if, say, if someone says Happy Christmas to them, they go, oh, I can't hear that again. A lot of people don't want to do it, and this is what people are saying here. For some people, they get depressed at Christmas and even angry because of the excessive commercialization of Christmas. The last thing you want to do is for your children to watch the telly at Christmas because, wow, they're going to get hit with adverts, aren't they, that are going to pressurize you. And the focus on gifts and the focus on perfect social activities, you know, you've got to have the next best thing, haven't you? You've got to have... What's going? You're going to have the new Baileys, which has got gold dust in it, you know, and you pay 30 quid a bottle for it. That's what happens every year. If you're a business person, you want to make a gin for next year that's going to really sell on you so that you can pay for your own children's Christmas presents and get them a box next year. <laughs> so you're going to stitch everyone up, aren't you? For some people, they get depressed and angry. And, be, and, and, and it says here, others get depressed because Christmas appears to be a trigger to engage in self-reflection and rumination about the inadequacies of life. And they form a victim mentality in comparison with other people who, have, who seem to have more and more to do. So I don't understand that. I don't know Judith might as a professional counsellor. But, but, but at Christmas they start to reflect on themselves. Do, do you un yeah. yeah, do you understand that? Yeah. They start to look in and, and their inadequacies. Now the only way I could look at that was perhaps parents who are who are saying, I can't reach the level of gifting that 
you know, my, my other, the other children have. Or, you know, if we have somebody around for a, a meal, you know, I, I can't reach the level of the person who I've invited. I can't, I can't open a bottle of champagne. It's got to be pop or whatever, you know, and, and they feel inadequate. Is that what they mean by that? I, th I thought that's what it was. Still others become anxious at Christmas because of the pressure from both commercial and self-induced um, spending. They spend a lot of money on gifts. I'm still reading this report. And, in, and incur increasing debt. Other people report that they dread Christmas because of the ex expectations for social gatherings with family, friends, and acquaintances that they'd rather not spend time with. <laughs> it's, like, it's supposed to be family time, isn't it? When we have the fe feasts and festivals, it's family time, isn't it? But Christmas, I didn't realize that most people didn't want to go to the fat fryer family do. <laughs> Finally, many people feel very lonely at Christmas because they've suffered loss of loved ones or jobs or they are actually on their own. And I tell you that, I don't know what we can do about that, but I'm open to do anything to help people overcome those feelings. If you've got ideas or you want to do something or you know something, let us know, let us be prepared, because I'm doing nothing on the 21st. I, I, you know, no. You're not doing, so we're around, don't we? I remember a Baptist minister emailing me and said, listen, I, I'd like a meeting with you. What day in, uh, in December are you available? And I wrote back and said, the 25th, how are you fixed? I haven't heard from him since. So, but they're traditions that we're enslaved by, aren't they? Isaiah 29, 13 says, The Lord said, Because these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is a human commandment. And then Yeshua adds to that and quotes it when he says in Mark 7, 5 to 9, he says, So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. That is, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Yes. And you abandon the commandment of God and hold on to the human tradition. <coughs> then he said to them, you are a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to keep your traditions. Yes. The traditions of man cause the demise of huma humanity. Because I wondered this morning, and there's no, there's no statistics for it, I couldn't find any, but I have been wondering all morning is, if, and I know, I, I've worked in areas that have been, that are very, very poor, and I know the deaths that people stoop to, to, to try and pay back what they owe. <coughs> what are people doing in January? to try and pay off the debts. What are, what are women, some women doing in January to pay off the debts? What are some men willing to do to pay off the debts? I don't want to see anybody in our community get to that place where they are. They're so under pressure from these debt collectors, because they are under pressure from debt collectors, that they are willing to do anything to pay off the debt. There are no statistics, but I would like to know what actually does happen. Because I think we need to pray about it. And yet, we here in this congregation are so blessed. We have blessings in abundance here. Massive, massive blessings. Not one of us is homeless, is it? Are we? Not one of us is homeless. There's nobody here starving, is there? Honestly, let's be truthful. Some of us have difficulties. I'm not saying that we don't. Some of us have difficulties. But if you do, you've got a family here to share them with. And we will do whatever we can to help you in those difficulties. You have people. But there are people who haven't in our community. Who have no family. Perhaps been rejected previously because of drugs or alcohol. Or because of marriages broken down, etc. They've got no family. And we have... Lots of things in the natural, but we also have something in the spiritual. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the presence of God with us. We have the Bible to give us guidance as to what to do. But I've been reflecting this last week 
on the Sabbath. We have the Sabbath now. Where God says in Exodus 31, He says, This is a sign between me and you. Amen. He says it's a sign. And when we talk about peace at Christmas time, it's not a patch on peace of the Sabbath. No. It's absolutely not a patch. <coughs> For six days of the, the year, the week, well, I was going to say six days of the year we work, <laughs> maybe that. <laughs> six days of the week we work, don't we? And we're actually enslaved to the things of man for those six days because we have to work to get money to, to, to live. We have to do those things. We, 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 we have to make profit, don't we, in, in our lives. We have to get, get things to, for our children, for our wives, for our, our families, our houses. We have to work for our home. We work to give to our government because it's right to pay our taxes. We work to pay for the National Health Service. No matter how bad it is, that's something we've got to pray about because it's in a terrible mess. We, we work for our houses. And then, on Friday night, we stop. And, and oh, I'm going to tell you what we do as a family, and I'm sure some of you are able to do this as well. We stop on a Friday tea time. And we have snacks, and then while Shirley's cooking the meal, we have these snacks, and we just sit together, start to talk, and we just, then we enter into the Sabbath, we light the candles, we have a meal, we pray, we have communion, but, the, but we don't skimp on a Sabbath. We don't skimp, there's no fasting on a Sabbath, don't fast on a Sabbath. It's a day of joy and a day of worship, it's a day of gladness. Enjoy, and we have a nice meal on Saturday morning. We get up late. We um, we have brunch. We have a nice brunch, whatever you know. It's eggs or, or you know a nice. We have croissants this morning. You know jam and all those things. Eleven o'clock in the morning, and that carries us through until we eat later on tonight. But we have a ball. And what I felt was I was praying for people who are who have, who are in families that are doing Christmas. And, and have to join in with that because it's yeah, family. It's, it's absolutely difficult. And, and, and some of you know how hard it is. And actually, we want to bless our family. You know, We don't want to sit in the corner, do we, with long faces. We're supposed to be light to our family. And what I felt was this. I felt that those of us who, who are able, oh, I, I guess we're all able, really, to a point, if we can invite somebody to our Sabbath table, on Friday night, which is the night before Christmas Eve. And we can actually make a big meal for them. And we can spoil them and ask those who are asking us to enter into Christmas to enter into our Sabbath with us and really spoil them. Not with lavish presents and everything, but just with love and with what food we have and make it really nice so that people that we are in in relationship with regularly see that actually the real peace and the real love come through those believers in God Almighty who keep his day of rest and peace. And it's only an idea, and I'm saying you should do, but you know what, I feel that that is the thing that we should be doing, doing to show people how we should respond to the, the enslavement of society. And, and we should bring God's peace to our family. We should try and do that. We should try and just encourage them to rest. Because Christmas Eve on Saturday is going to be really hard for most people. Isn't it? Rushing around. Trying, they're afraid they've left the, the gravy granules in the car. And, you know, isn't it? And, and, uh, and the Christmas lights won't work. So the husband's rushing off at 5 o'clock to try and get a set of Christmas lights or a fuse. You know, that's it's madness. We can actually make a difference, you know. We can by asking people to share in our Sabbath, particularly this year, because Friday night is, takes us into what is Christmas Eve. Give them a blessing. Let's help people to be blessed. And I wanted to finish off with prayer, but I wanted to um, ask on ask you something. We, we have just started to connect with a, 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 <clears throat> a little community in Commons Quay who have nine homeless mothers 
or women, no? Mothers. And all, some are, they're all women, aren't they? But they're not all mothers. And me and Lynn went there to see the girl who runs it. And, um, uh, and, and Becky is going to go on Monday. She's been in touch since then because we've asked Jane, who is this manager of this charity, to come and speak to us in the well on the 10th of January. But uh, Jane has emailed us and said, will you help us with the raffle? Well, well we don't do a raffle, do we? Now, the, 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 uh, what we could do is to respond and say, we don't do a raffle, thanks very much. We're against raffles. But I want to do this. I want you just, just, just to ask God if it's right for us to give them a gift and say, we don't want to enter into the raffle, but we would like to give you a gift, not because it's Christmas, and we'll explain that to you. Not because it's Christmas, but because we want to show the love of God every month of the year, or every day of the year. And I think that is probably the best response for us. So while we pray and when we worship, can we just ask you if you want to give an offering? Ask Ruth if, if that's right, if the elders think that's right. Is it right, do you think, to do that? Yeah. Not because it's Christmas, but because it's love, yeah. it's compassion. And Becky and I will go on Monday and, um, and, and maybe give the gift from you. And it will take the pressure. These, these women haven't got anything. They're there because they've been made homeless for various reasons. The sad thing is, when, and I'm not being sexist here, I know the truth of this, when men are made homeless, they find it really hard to get shelter anywhere. But when women are made homeless, at least there, is these, there are these places, and there are nine ladies in this place, and they're teaching them to cook, and they're teaching them and helping them. So I just thought we might show our love, not Christmas love, but maybe Sabbath love, <coughs> To them and, and do what the Jews call a mitzvah, which is a good thing. Val. Hi, Matt. Are you just talking about our physical physical men? Do you know that there's no facilities in this area? The only nearest one where they can get a bed is Chester or Will. Oh, well, did you hear that? You probably didn't. The only place that they can get a men can get a bed is Chester or Will. I think we should. Chester, they'll only take their own. Right. And if there's a spare place, then they'll take from outside. Yeah. And there's no access either. So this area we have something. There's nothing for the men, for the homeless. Well, thank you, Val, for bringing that. Good. I'm going to ask Keith now. Keith, did you hear that? Keith, I'm going to ask Keith to lead prayer. Are you with me to pray for these people who are homeless? Are you, are you, are you with us for that? And, and for the people who are in debt and getting in debt because of this Christmas festival. Are you with me? Yeah. Should we, so Keith, can I hand over to you yes. to do that? And she goes, can you play? And then, and then after we, let's really press in. Uh, Shirley was saying earlier on that, that she felt 